prelude, if we could uh, be seated. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. That was beautiful. Um, I'm a little biased, too, but hopefully we'll all... <laughs> all right, sweet, sweet. Um, so, yeah, welcome, everybody, to our uh, multi-platform uh, service at the Unitarian Church of Staten Island. It's wonderful to have everyone with us, both those joining us in person and those uh, online. Um, if you are joining us in person, please feel free to join us for hospitality afterwards, coffee and bagels and whatnot through those doors. And for those joining us online, um, feel free to uh, introduce yourself in the chat box. And after service, you're invited to 
hang out with each other in a, a virtual coffee hour. Um, a few reminders. Our visiting minister, Ember Kelly, has regular office hours on Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, to schedule a meeting, please email ember at minister at uucsi.org. See the weekly newsletter for more information. And weekly gatherings include our women's group via Zoom on Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. See Kathy Santo for details. Kathy, I don't, is Kathy going to be here? Or, well, then I maybe see Tom. Is that, can, he can, Kathy's husband can give that information. And he can also give the information for the men's group. So see him if you're interested. Um, why don't you raise your hand, Tom? I don't know, in case people don't know you. There you go. See, see that guy. Um, please support our social media outreach. Please like and share our weekly posts on Facebook and Instagram. And remember, um, all our services are, can also be found on YouTube. Um, so for those joining in person, now's the time to uh, please silence your mobile devices. And now let us prepare for this morning's service. And if you'd like to follow along with the opening words today, we're actually going to be reading them out of the gray hymnal number 436. So from David C. Pohl, um, actually, this seems like a call and response. So it, it, uh, why don't you all um, say the uh, words in italics, and I will say the words not in italics. We come to this time and this place. To renew our faith in the holiness, goodness, and beauty of life. To rekindle the flame of memory and hope, and to reclaim the vision of an earth made fair with all her people. Thank you. I now invite you to join me in lighting our chalice. You can find the affirmation in our order of service. We light this chalice in the search for truth and the spirit of love. We unite in worship and fellowship. As an extension of lighting our chalice, I want to take a moment of silence to light these candles for some of the names um, who have recently been affected by police brutality. We cannot cover all the names of those affected. But this morning, we light a candle for the life of Eric Seckington, for the life of Sterling Ramon Alavachi, and for the life of Boyd Douglas Phillips. May these lights be a symbol of our commitment to continue the work of racial justice and to proclaim that black lives matter. And I guess I'll now please join us in singing uh, hymn number 346. Come sing a song with me in your gray hymnal.
So now is the time in our service for joys and sorrows. If you're visiting us for the first time, this is the time you can introduce yourselves. Um, for those gathering in person, we invite you to raise your hand and then stand where you're seated. I'll give you the microphone to share your joy or sorrow. We invite you to share what's in your heart. And those joining online, please type in the chat your joys or sorrows. Uh, John and Eric will read them aloud. We also invite you to share what's in your heart. Anybody? Yes, Sarah. Good morning. I'm Sarah Rachel Walters. Uh, my joy today is, um, I have a joy and a sorrow, but my joy is on Tuesday, my husband and I, and he's right here, <laughs> uh, we will be traveling to India um, to celebrate his 85th birthday. Um, and, we'll, uh, and then he will, can spend with family and friends because my husband's family is originally from there. So we'll look forward to that. Um, my sorrow, and with I'm sure you all agree, uh, is on the death of Alexei Navalny. Uh, and I can only say, this is what happens when you have a dictator running your country, even a dictator for a day. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Marge. Marge, it's so good to see you here. I, I, just, I just felt like I wanted to say, I, I warmly, Marge was the one that first took care of John and Eric when we brought them to the church for the f first time. So we're always deeply appreciated for that. Thank you. Yes, as I said, my name is Marge, and I haven't been here, I don't know how many years. I know it was before COVID, um, but um, and I've had some health issues and whatever, but I'm d doing a lot better now, although it's still toothless. Um, and um, I'm just really happy to be back here and see the smiling faces and know what good work is done out of this place. And um, thank you all for having me. <laughs> I just want to say I'm thrilled to see Carolyn. <laughs> So last week, we did talk about the uh, creative freedom um, event, event. But Ben wasn't here for us to acknowledge all that he did for that. So can we clap for Ben, please? <laughs> but can we also try to get everybody, I know this is annoying, but could you stand up if you attended if you donated, if you were part of it. Because I think so, Carol, that means you. So I think, I think, and Ben, and you know, stand up, stand up, Ben. Because it was a, a lot of people who were part of this event. Um, it really is literally half the church, if not more. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so let's do it again, but not too soon. But thank you, everyone. I hope you feel acknowledged and recognized for your efforts. Um, my joy is that yesterday I got to um, spend several hours uh, with our quarter time minister, Amber Kelly, um, as we planned our sermon for the end of the month on February 25th. So got a lot of work done, finalized a lot of stuff, just very excited, had a really wonderful time conversing with her. Um, and I'm really looking forward to doing that, so. Hi, good morning, I'm Chris. <clears throat> Just passing along that um, the end of April around Earth Day, we're gonna have a speaker from, um, who's gonna talk about Frederick Law Olmsted. And we probably all know about Frederick Law Olmsted and he's a national figure. But he, he spent time on Staten Island and uh, the Beale family, you know, lived in the house that he used to live in for maybe less than 10 years a bunch of years ago. But anyway, the gentleman who's going to be doing um, the speaking is a, is, a, is a Frederick Law Olmsted historian in his own right. And we thought that there was a connection. And he said that, yes, Frederick Law Olmsted was good friends with both George William Curtis and Francis Shaw. He even did some landscaping work on the Shaw estate. So he's going to be talking about our founders and their relationship with Frederick Law Olmsted. So I thought that was pretty cool. My sorrow is that someone left their gloves 
by our entry table. My joy is that everyone is still here and you didn't leave and forget your gloves. <laughs> I guess Laura. Anybody else? Do we have anything in the chatter? Um, Nancy Akita says, thanks to Robin Lachmanda and Chris Johnson for driving me to and from my doctor's appointment on Friday, and to Kathy Santo for making arrangements. And that's it. Thank you for sharing your joys and sorrows with us and for those held silently in your hearts. Um, so now we're going to pause for meditation. I'll offer a prompt to focus our meditation, then ring this bell. Um, at that point, I invite you to begin meditation with three deep breaths. After a few minutes, I will ring the bell again to mark the end of our time. Today's prompt is a quote from Paul Tillich, who Wendy will be sharing with us about soon. I'll introduce her properly later. Um, and that quote is as follows. Uh, Whatever concerns a person ultimately becomes God for them. We'll get that.
Our reading this morning is from chapter one of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, translated by Benjamin Hoff. Um, the way that can be followed is not the eternal way. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. Without name is the origin of heaven and earth. Has name is the mother of every earthly being. Consistently desire without form in order to study its mysteries. Consistently desire has form in order to study its frontiers. The previous two are the same energy but have different designations. When those are joined, that is called growing darkness or mystery. The darkness of ever increasing darkness is the many mysteries gateway. And now is a time in our order of service where we take an offering. We know it's the gifts of all of us that help support our ability to thrive and gather. For those attending in person, we will be passing a collection plate. For those online, links and instructions will be posted in the chat. You can mail us a check or donate through the PayPal giving page on our website. Please give as generously as you can, and our offerings will now be gratefully received. Thank you. And uh, for the offertory music, er Eric Michaels will be presenting Souvenir de Sarasate by William H. Postoc.
Thanks so much, Eric. Um, please join us now in singing hymn number 134, Our World is One World and Your Gray Hymnal. So we're so privileged to have Wendy Raver with us this morning. Uh, Wendy Raver is the current director of the program in religion at uh, CUNY's Hunter College. Her work involves ancient history and religious interconnections, mainly in Egypt and the late Bronze Age. But she's passionate about all areas of study, uh, of, of history, I should say, and religious interconnections. She became attracted to Tillich's te teachings after grad school and is always looking for ways to include his ideas in the classroom. And I, I might add, she's also a uh, teacher of much of New York City's uh, homeschool community. Eric and John are privileged to have taken classes f uh, from her, such as ancient Greek civilizations, justice and injustice, and even the history of espionage. That was, that was a cool one. Um, and, and maybe in the, in the teaching vein, um, which I think a lot of us like to do this, um, when appropriate, after Wendy speaks, uh, she'll open the floor to questions and we can have more of a uh, classroom discussion after we, we hear her ideas presented to us. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Wendy Raver. Sorry, hi. Um, thank you so much, John, and thank you so much, um, John and Eric. It's my privilege to have you. Like this is, it's, it's fantastic having you in the classes, and thank you so much for having me here today as well, too. But at this point, you might be wondering, what does the Tao Te Ching have in connection to a, a German theologian who was from the 20th century? And that, in a sense, is Paul Tillich and what he taught what he believed, and just how much he influenced this whole field of religious studies in which I work. But um, so he formed this like just indelible part of our classes that we have at Hunter. But he also serves to bridge gaps and to offer like very much in the fourth principle of looking at like a search for truth and meaning. But like what Lao Tzu's way would hold to, um, to name it would be to end it. Um, to say, I have the truth, or this is the only way, or this is the pathway to the holy, would eliminate that idea of the search itself. And that search for Tillich implied faith. And to have that faith for him was ultimate concern. So when we first start bringing up Tillich in our classes, immediately it's a lot of terms. People think they know what faith is. Um, when they hear ultimate concern, they're not really clear on what that might mean. But just to give an example of where Tillich came across this term, um, he was 
raised in a conservative family. His father was a conservative Lutheran minister. His mother was a little bit more liberal, but he becomes ordained. Of course, his father is a minister. He's going to be a minister. And then World War I breaks out. So he serves. He serves as a chaplain in the military. And he sees unspeakable horrors. He comes back. And he's just wounded. Um, and just his intellectual pathway, his spiritual pathway was just paused for him. And then somehow he came across this painting. And it's by the artist Franz Marc. And it's just called Yellow Horses. And all it is are in an assemblage of yellow horses kind of merged together and very bright and very beautiful. And the, something just hit him when he saw this. And when he saw this, the, there's no Jesus, there's no cross, but he felt that there was something deeper in this. And he thought that this was a ground of being, if anything. And for this, for Tillich, this is God. And it's an ultimate reality that can't be named. So similar to the Tao Te Ching in that way. But it's something that's around us. And in terms of symbols that can point to this. So whereas he had been raised to think of certain forms found in his religious tradition as being the pathway to find God, he found it more in those yellow horses that Franz Marc had painted. That I doubt Franz Marc even thought that this was what he was would be a gateway to the holy for Dilek when he painted this. And likewise, he'll talk about a painting by Cezanne, for example. That's a bowl of fruit. And at the same time, for Tillich, this bowl of fruit represented more of an ultimacy and a yearning to the holy than the paintings he was seeing around him that had all the proper characters, all the right players. Um, and for him, this is it, it implied that there was something bigger going on. Um, past the ritual, past the responsibilities, there was something deeper, a deeper connection. And if you could find that through a painting, um, you certainly could find it in your traditional religion, but there was also that trap of idolatry, making the religion itself the holy. Um, but some people could see beyond that. But it also bridged this gap between this J Lutheran pastor and his Catholic neighbors, or the Jewish communities that were a part of his world too. And this also made him think about other world traditions as well. And those who at, were talking about the early 20th century here um, were very science-minded and might have thought that they didn't have religion. But for Tillich, they did. They just were using the wrong terms. They were using the wrong name for it. But, but this is Weimar Germany. This is Hitler rising to power, too. So, and guess what? Hitler doesn't like Tillich. Are you surprised by that? <laughs> yeah, um, not a good match for this. Because Tillich had this affinity for humankind, which is very reflective in the principles for this and looking at inherent goodness in human beings. Hitler did not have this, let's just say. Um, so, um, and Hitler did not have this positive view. So he is basically asked to leave Germany or we will kill you. Um, and he comes to America. He teaches. Um, he taught at Union Seminary for a while. He taught at University of Chicago for a while. And he died in 1965. But um, but what he taught, though, helped to make our little program in the program in religion at Hunter College, which is entirely secular, um, broaden out the idea of what could be considered a religious studies program. So there's not one book, there's not one God, not one way. And this is like trying to get students to think of there being this dimension of depth in one's spiritual life that Tillich talked about, that's the true answer to what comparative religions are, sometimes is very shocking to them because they come in either having been taught that they have the way and they have the truth and their texts are the only way. And then I'll say, well, what about your neighbor who also has that? You know, you have your truth. 
They have their truth. Maybe there's something you have in common with this. And in some cases, they walk right out the door. And in other cases, they stop and they listen to think, well, okay, what could this be then? Or they come in and they try to disprove. They think they already know about what religion is, but they have to take just like a, a general class, like to fulfill the requirements. So, but they're science majors, they're STEM majors. And then when we bring up the idea that religion can also be found in astrophysics or in mathematics, and that contemplating the unknown and contemplating that in mathematics, can one get to the last number? Or is it ongoing and ever moving forward? Or in, even in doing math equations, you're doing things that might have an immediate solution and might not. But they start to then think, okay, well, maybe this is this. And then we can take it to religions that have incorporated math, like in Islam and look at some of the artwork, the geometric forms. And they start looking at that as an algorithm, but then they see that there's something behind it too. And in Islam, during its golden age, which we're gonna be talking about next week in our class, guys, um, but we are gonna be looking at this in terms of like trying to not, not hold God, not contain a God, but to try to like reach God, to become closer to God, and to contemplate the mystery of God, too. So, and then for some students, this is also a very shocking thing to do for this, because this is not what they would hold. Um, so when we bring up also the definition of religion, this is very tough for some of our students. And I don't think this extends to students. Does this extend to people in your own lives as well? When you say religion, they immediately turn and walk the other way. But for Tillich, he'll talk about this battle that he was seeing between the theologian and the scientist. And the theologian would say, I have God, here it is. It looks like this, it sounds like this, it wrote this and only this. But the scientist was actually more religious because the scientist opened up ways of understanding what God was. And he said that in some ways the theologian has created more atheists than the scientist, but is atheism even a term that would apply here too? If you find ultimate concern, you have a God that you have in a sense created or a pathway to something that's bigger in ultimate reality. So, so we see these differences that come up with fundamentalism which has definitely risen in the last few years, where students will have this as the only way. Um, we'll see this with even the question, can anything be religion? And the answer for Tillich was yes, anything can be religion. But what's the dimension of depth in spiritual life? And he would go on to make his students and also to make like his friends and anyone associated with them contemplate these things that if we as human beings have a moral function why do we do moral things is it because we have to or is there a bigger calling do you do it when no one's looking you know you do you do it to get rewards do you do it to get points or do you do it because you have a moral demand that's coming from something and the same with cognitive we have this desire to know things, but what is the quest for knowledge? And isn't that bigger than just trying to find and collect information and collect facts and figures? And then there's this creative spirit that human beings have too. So do we create just to get something done to do the work? Or are we contemplating this level of an absolute are we trying to reach an ultimate reality? So for Franz Mark and those horses, for Tillich, that was as, a, more of a religious painting than one would find in Renaissance Europe in many cases. If you were told to paint this, you painted it. Franz Mark did not do it. You found the horses? Yeah, cool. yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So they, thank you, <laughs> yeah. But, um, but so Tillich sounds great, right? But um, 
he had some big issues when it came to mysticism. And he said that a lot of people would feel like, okay, I've had a religious experience, I win, I'm in, I got it, yay. But they don't do anything beyond that. And so he said mysticism also has to lead beyond to something else. And it has to be grounded in other avenues of the spiritual life. You can't have that connection of direct, immediate experience and then forget that there's also a moral demand that's part of the human spiritual life or that there's also this desire to create as well. So Tillich also thought, okay, but when people hear religion, oftentimes it turns into institutionalized religion, right? So he'll say that religion can do these things, like it takes the dust off of our daily life and our daily work. And it opens up this experience of the holy. And in this sense, for Tillich, this is this ultimate reality. He was very hesitant to use the G word because that means so many things to so many different people. But yes, could it mean that you can find this through gardening? Could you find this through pursuing like, you know, any field whatsoever? And you could. But the institutions for Tillich were the things that were like, like teaching like to despise the secular realm and to make the institutions then into absolutes and to make a rise of fundamentalism to teach that there only is one way. And this would then seek to divide people rather than bringing them together. If you have this image of Tillich, you have one sun in a way, but many pathways to that one sun. And in that case, any religion could fit. Any other pathway could fit. And then it would reach this one bigger sense of an absolute. So this, in a sense, what Tillich wanted to try to offer. Um, and then so grows this field of religious studies. Our program at Hunter was founded five years after Tillich died. So it's very Tillich infused. And one of the first things that the director did was incorporate Native American beliefs and practices. And to hesitate even calling religion, it, but just what people from various Native American nations do. Um, West African traditions that were not influenced by Christian, Christianity or Islam, but seeing them as gateways in the sense that Tillich would see as pathways. And then one of our classes that was quite popular, um, faith and disbelief, atheism, religion and science, astrology and world religions. Um, we've had classes on looking at religion from a more traditional place where we study Quran and we study um, New Testament. And yet we also have a class coming out on queerness and religion. So it brought, it bridges every possible gap or so we try. And we also have a very diverse student population where students come in perhaps having been again taught something and not seeing that they could have a bigger connection for their set for themselves personally, but also to something bigger. So in a nutshell, these are the types of things that Tillich stood for and that Tillich wanted to try to see. He wanted to try to build a community where every individual had an ultimate concern. And how difficult is that when our concerns are money, rent, life, what we need to move through, um, but that there was something that was much larger than those things. And oftentimes we'll hear, well, I want to try to lead a good life so I can get to the next plane of existence after this life. I'll, I'll get to go to heaven. And for Tillich, that's great, but is that the goal? But are you doing it with ultimate concern? And the two don't have to be the same thing. So this was what he wanted to see that was faith. And for him, faith is that thing that was, it gave courage and it gave hope. And he 
when he used the G word, the God word, it was usually with a lowercase letter in his writings. And then he would say, like when he's talking about ultimate reality and that ultimate concern that leads you toward that ultimate reality, if you want to call that God, you may. But that's the God that exists that all of these other types of gods point toward. And if you have those institutions that make themselves the holy, or those belief systems that make themselves the absolute, they're never going to reach that. So in a nutshell, this is what I do, but I think that what Tillich was trying to express in his writings extend beyond that. Um, and it will hit each individual very differently, as it should, but also combine people together in a community of seeking and of looking beyond and finding hope. And within that hope, utilizing faith for this. So to find it like Lao Tzu is not to hold it. Um, once you own it, it's not really there anymore. It's not absolute. It's not the way, it's not the flow, yeah? And in my own life, I apply this as an historian. I'm a social scientist. I'm in the texts. I'm in myth and ritual, artifacts, archeology. span And it's easy to get so caught up in this, the data. But what's beyond the data? Tillich would probably, if he were here, say, look at those things as the portal. Look at those things as the window to what was beyond them. And this is his journey. Um, this is what he would want in general for people to reconsider that word religion that is so often misused and so often tainted, but to see it as an endless search. And for Tillich, it would be in this like varied conceptualization, conceptualization of God. So, thank you so much for having me. So, does this spark any thought? Okay, yeah, it does. <laughs> I saw Sally first. And then I... uh, it's so interesting that you brought Tillich uh, to, to this talk uh, when I was, uh, I think it was a sophomore in college in 1967. Mm -hmm. I took a class in comparative religion, yeah. it was a seminar. And the text was Paul Tillich. Great. And, and then we studied um, Friedrich Engels as mm -hmm. a, you know, and, and other books that you know, made us re rethink a, a religion. I had already probably lost my faith yeah. <laughs> before then when I read another book. But um, it did help me be open-minded about um, uh, what religion was. And that was just a couple of years after he died. And the man who... Uh, ran the seminar. He was very good, and I think it opened up the students' minds and certainly helped open up mine. So I think really thank you for bringing him. You know, he's definitely a you you. He uh, is. He I is say. right. <laughs> yeah. Toward the end, he just didn't want to claim anything, but that's you you too, right? That's what it's about. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, thank you. I think he would have been very happy to hear that, <laughs> you know, that um, Tillich is still in the American Academy of Religion. There still is a whole panel on Tillich studies and looking at what Tillich, how Tillich would apply current situations and current, field, current fields of study, what Tillich would say about them. So, yeah. And Wendy told me when she was looking up the principles and it seemed so like the same, she, she Googled, is, was Paul Tillich Unitarian or something, right? Didn't you yeah, tell me that? So, I saw it in some, yeah. he seemed to be. Hi, again, thank you. It's so interesting, refreshing uh, for the subject. I never studied uh, comparative religion, but I was, I was thinking this week, like someone was telling me, oh, uh, they have a neighbor who's an engineer, and now he's going to go to law school. I go, why doesn't he go like, to divinity school? Like, yeah. wh why would you go from the pot to the kettle instead of, you know, something more diverse. So uh, I was thinking about it. And so as you were speaking, I thought of a question. Do you think or would Tillich think that our modern egos, our modern experiences um, make us less fit 
to search for or, or approach understanding ultimate reality or God or whatever. Yeah, I think we're definitely like, we're, yeah, we're definitely in that muck right now where we become the ultimate ourselves, we become the temple. Um, there's another writer that I love called Don, Don Cupid. I don't know if anyone has ever read his work, but he says that religion has changed to become a cult of life. And if anything, it's about our lives, our success, our things, our, we be, each individual becomes not just looking for their God and understanding for it, but they become the God in many ways. So we see that. But um, I think Tillich would definitely see that we are losing that sense of hope by this too. Because for him, that was, you like to have that sense of an ultimacy that was outside of the human ego, that was beyond that, that was hope. And when the hard times come, that's armor. And to know that there's something, um, and to bring in an expression, in Judaism, I don't know which rabbi said this, but it's that when you fall, you fall into God's lap. And I think for Tillich, it's that the true God opens up when all of the gods of success and self and ego um, have withered away or have been shot down, whatever have you. But that's when the true God opens up. And to not have that um, is free falling, you know? Thank so. you. Yeah. And hence that term ground of being. You know, it's just that ground of being was God for Tillich. And and again, he was so scientific about it and so no no offense intended, but very German intellectually about this. And then he saw the horses and something shifted. So Yeah, I thank you, Wendy. It's really, you know, great to hear this. And I, I my takeaway was, you know, we're going through so much reckoning of the binary world that we live in on mm -hmm. so many levels. And when you've been a Unitarian for more than a minute and a half, knowing that so many of the, quote, organized religions, and I'm not looking to disparage anybody, but um, claim that, you know, religious and faith is all God-centric, mm -hmm. big G, God-centric. Yeah. And for those of us who don't believe that, yeah. there's a way to want to be able to reclaim just even the language that we use and the narratives that we use mm -hmm. to explore that deeper. And um, as I said, since we're uh, looking to break through the binary world we live in on so many levels, you know, this is, <laughs> it's long overdue for those of us who are not God-centric to be able to say, I am a faith-based person and I'm a person of religion and to have it recognized. Absolutely, absolutely. And to like have a very serious space for that too. So. Hi, my name is Laura, and I, I do have a background in religious studies. Yeah. Um, the class I remember the most was actually an undergraduate class, and it was called Religion and Fantasy. Okay. And uh, I think of it now because one of the primary books we used in that class was Dune, which is again being Dune's. remade and out there, and we used them. Um, Ursula Le Guin, a wizard of Earthsea. And I know people in this congregation read. And that was my awakening, was that you could find God in fantasy books, which I hadn't really read. But that was what really opened me up. It wasn't just, OK, it's all the different rays of the sun, which it is, but one of those rays can be found in the kind of literature that we read to escape, that we read for, for pleasure. So I just wanted to kind of further the, the great, wonderful sermon you just gave um, in that way. Oh, thank you, thank you. For me personally, it was Walt Whitman. I'd never considered myself a, a God person, but a religious person, and then Walt Whitman did it for me. Walt Whitman did it, yeah, so. Anybody else? Jonathan? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. What I love about this church is that instead of a crucifix, we have a circle. Mm -hmm. Terrence McKenna, when he walked into a church, when he was on LSD, he walked into a church and said, we've got it all wrong. It's not the crucifix that's God. It's the, it's the rose window. Mm -hmm. And Tillich said, right, that God is not, be, not a being, is being, but is being itself. 
and I loved your talk because it sort of emphasized all that. But I'm wondering to you, is there much difference between that and it's all Brahman, it's all Shiva, it's all Tao, and it, is there a better symbol of a connection than that center point, which is defined by its relation to the circumference, and the circumference, yeah. which is defined by its relation to the center point? Yeah. And that even from Tillich's, but when people talk about moral and this and that, aren't you possibly creating a tangent line away from that center point? And why not say, God is Hitler too, but a God in a very playful way beyond our normal sense of what play would be? Yeah. No, I think it is. Like, it's, all of it can be rooted in the thou art that. You know, that right. it's like, saying. so it can be, like, and we bring such a Western view to it that it has to be conceptualized that it could be Taoism and it could be um, Catholicism. It could be anything. Um, but it's just that does it go to an ultimacy? Could it be Hitler? Um, Hitler had immediate definite goals. He didn't, like, I will do this. I will finish this. I will do, I will build this. And nothing that necessarily reached beyond it. So Tillich was also not a very big fan of communism, which he was seeing around, where he was watching um, communism in theory and seeing like the communal spirit of people was different than what he was seeing happening in the world. And seeing how, as we've just seen recently with Navalny's um, death, that what happens when you get corrupt people in powerful positions. And, but it was an end result for their means and not anything that extended beyond them. And I think the symbol is perfect for this too, though. Um, when it comes to moral, always the question is, well, who's morals too? And this is like, if, 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 is there a universal moral code? And Tillich read Kant, he played around with those ideas, whether there is a moral imperative. But it's difficult to say, because if it's something that is moral for the sake of being moral based on community and based on tradition and values, not necessarily. But if it was something, or to your leader, which is one of those things. We do these things for obedience, or out of obedience. But what if it goes beyond to something that is higher? Like, I want to not kill people because, um, you know, that, that's something in me that says I cannot do that, even if asked. But it's a demand, and I have to kind of exercise, well, where do I get that demand? I have to think about it. And I have to meditate on that. And then that would be for Tillich a response, I would think. But not that it's still, it can be distracting. It can absolutely take one off that path because they may end up just following the rules because without thinking about them. And then we have to circle back and think, well, why? And what's, what's the bottom line with all of it? And same with knowledge, like what do we know? Why do we seek it? Why do we want to? And is it because it helps us to connect more to something bigger? Then I'll then go for it. But if it's only for that end result, then it doesn't quite fit for him. Does that make sense? Okay. So. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody in the chat? Have a question? Or anybody here? Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Please join us in singing hymn number 123, Spirit of Life, in your gray hymnal.
I invite you to join me in extinguishing our chalice. You can find the affirmation in our, in our order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. For these we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Um, and the closing words can also be found in our gray hymnal, number 699. And Eric and John, do you guys want to come up and um, just get ready? They're going to do the postlude. So, no rush. Um, I'm just going to turn as well, 699. Um, so I'll read this. Whatever things are true, whatever things are honor, sorry, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honorable, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Thanks, guys.